Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of From the Stump. So this week we um, we have some really good conversation. Uh, Greg, who was on here previously, uh, who's a licensed forester and has an awful lot of experience on the sawmill, uh, said when he had a minute he would do a walk around and give us some guidelines, uh, give all of you um, some guidelines on how he manages certain properties and why he takes what he cuts and why he leaves what he leaves and uh, uh, shows some other uh, demonstrations and some other uh, things to look at for tension. Um, you know, what to leave alone and, and what to take and what to look for. So really informative video. Uh, Greg's always super impressive, uh, you know, when you get to dig into his brain a little bit and, uh, and pull some of the knowledge out of that. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass that over to, to the video that he shot for us. Uh, then I'm going to come back, um, and then we've still got a ton of stuff to talk about from last week. Overwhelming response, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. Love all the feedback. Love the positive comments. Uh, it's fantastic. we got a ton of questions and stuff to go over uh, from that as well, and then we'll follow up with what Greg has to say on this video. So stay tuned, and uh, I'll see you shortly. Thanks, Trevor. We're out here in western New York. Holland, town of Holland, and uh, we're working on a property that I've been managing for the last seven years from a friend of ours out here. They have 80 acres, and uh, a lot of it is good hardwood timber and native woods, so uh, it's a good area to produce good quality timber. So a lot of times you got to look at the ground you're on, and in the past, this has been harvested uh, on a good basis of about 20 years, so the timber in here is getting pretty mature. And you can see with this big black cherry, 28 inch diameter tree right here. So we're going to take a walk around and uh, show everybody how you can grow beautiful trees with the right patience and maintenance on your property. So I was showing you a large cherry tree. Another dominant species we have in Western New York, which brings in good value is hard maple, sugar maple. And behind me, as you can see, there are some more mature trees that are almost ready to harvest. We like to wait until our timber is around the 22 inch diameter range. That way we're getting full logs, more length and volume. And as you can see, these trees are tall and they've been competing for light in the past since we've been harvesting in here. And you can see two stories, uh, an understory of small sugar maples with all the bright leaves with the amount of sunlight that's lighting them up in the background. And we have some major dominant trees here. So this woodlot is now on a rotation, a two-stage woods, which when you're going for timber production, that's kind of what you're looking for. So you can get uh, everything on a rotation and uh, have some mature trees. So follow me up this way and check out some more maple here. Let's take a closer look at some of the bark. Come right up close here. This this is an old sugar maple here, probably 26 to 27 inches in diameter. And uh, as you can see, the bark's starting to get a little flaky on here. Still pretty uniform, so the tree's still putting on growth. And we measure them every few years to see just how uh, our rates of growth are in here. So five years ago, this tree was probably around the 24 inch range. And uh, now it's gained an inch, an inch and a half maybe. And uh, it start, it's on a good, good drainage here you know we've got a creek bed where all the water flows and that's important too so that's another thing i mean the biggest thing really with good quality timber is having it on good soil and uh, we've got good soil here and good drainage so sugar maple don't like it very wet most trees like to see the water drain out and uh, there's only a few types of trees that like to, to grow in wet areas so you got to know your species with your soil types but these maples are some smaller ones here, and uh, they're all spaced pretty close, but as you can see, they're doing just fine. So sometimes uh, people get worried, they think they're too close to each other, but uh, these trees have plenty of room to grow, and they've been doing pretty good. So one of the questions that we're going to answer is, uh, what trees do we leave? What trees do we cut? Why do we mark them to cut? Why do we leave them? And that's pretty much the... Uh, biggest questions in forestry as a forester when you're out there a lot of foresters have different opinions you know everybody's got their own practices that they've learned over time and experience so uh, we also work with that along with the landowner's goals so there's a lot of variables and things that can happen in a woodlot uh, 
depending on what people use for management strategies. So trees to leave, trees to cut, uh, those big mature hardwoods that we were just looking at, those trees will be marked for the next harvest here because they're at mature size, they're of good quality, good form, and uh, they will bring in the biggest dollar per tree. To my right and left, we've got some really nice intermediate hard maple trees, which are around the 14 to 15 inch diameter. A uh, tree really becomes merchantable around here at the 16 to 18 inch diameter, and the big commercial sawmills will take a log down to about 12 to 10 inches in diameter. So on a, if you're harvesting a 15 inch tree now, you might only get one log out of it until you get down with the amount of taper to a 16 foot log, you might already be at 12 inches to a 15 inch tree. So 26 inch diameter tree, you might get two to possibly three, two and a half to three logs out of something like that. So instead of harvesting a tree now and getting about a third of the percentage of volume that you would get, uh, you might as well wait in the tree's lifetime. You know, it's only, it's already almost mature. So let it grow another 10, 12 years and uh, you'll definitely reap the benefits so we're going to leave this this maple here and let it grow for our next cutting down the road because it's really nice. It's on good drainage as well. It's got tight, uniform bark. We don't see too many defects. It's a couple small bumps in the scar, but uh, other than that, it's a good form tree. And this tree to my left here is uh, also sugar maple, and it has a big union where we split off into two. So we got a couple more seams, and the quality's a little less here. So when it comes time to do our next harvest of our mature trees that we were previously looking at, we might mark this maple as a call tree and take it out for firewood just to release the canopy on this intermediate maple here and make sure that it keeps thriving with the right amount of sun. So most of this tree is already put on most of its primary growth. Now we're looking for that secondary growth where the trees are putting on diameter and a full crown and canopy. So another question we're going to get to is uh, the topic of tension in trees and uh, timber and as it grows, you know, and geographic, you know, locations, topography, and uh, why trees would have tension, what causes it. And we'll go over a few things because there's lots of different reasons and ways trees can get tension. Um, right now I'm standing on a decent little bank here and we have a lot of timber growing up off the uh, edge here because it's typically a good spot for timber to grow. They're fighting to get to light from the trees on the top of the bank or the trees above that. So typically timber on banks are going to grow really fast when they're young to try to hit that light. And they also have great drainage being right on the bank where the creek is. So the tree. So when the tree's young, they're going to put on lots of growth. And uh, sometimes the first type of tension we can get is when a small sapling would be growing on the bank and they're fighting for light and they grow so fast that the cells can stretch out, elongate in that direction when a tree is young in the intermediate all species. So that's one way that tension can be created. And that way is hard to tell um, by looking at the tree, you know, where it's growing. The tree can look perfectly straight and uh, you wouldn't know even if the heart was centered in that tree too, that's, you would not be able to tell. So that's the toughest type of tension to uh, find out. And really that is just, you're just gonna find out once you cut into it with your sawmill. Um, the other type of tension is from a tree growing on the bank when you have the whole root system coming in uh, under one side of the tree. So if your tree is hanging out over the bank and all the roots are on this side, you know, it's got weight, it's putting weight on trying to hold all that weight and uh, you'll get a tight pack of rings, growth rings on the inside and then the outside of the tree, the heart might be, you know, more towards the bank because when that tree starts growing and then it kind of turns as it goes up. So you get tension created from just the form of the roots and the pressure of the tree itself and the weight hanging over the bank. And uh, when you go to cut into those trees, you can see the heart on the very end of the log. So you'll see where the heart's off center and your tight rings and your bigger rings on the side. So you might get some lift on your boards. And uh, when you cut into the sides of the log where the, the grains are rapidly changing, you might get your boards that peel sideways off of the mill. But we'll take a walk down this bank and just show you a few more examples. There 
right here we've got a beautiful hard maple and if you come real close to this one you can see just how well it's growing uh the growth cracks in the tree in between the furrows of the bark are actually pretty uniform and tight and uh this spring they were orange inside the cracks so you can see that beginning of that cambium layer saying that this tree's putting on some really good growth right now with this uniform bark and down here is another example of a young maple. This one's actually died because it got uh, cleaned out from some other hemlocks in this area. But just the form, the form of the root system is what I'm trying to show you there that can create that tension from growing on banks. And if you look down through this valley, there's uh, some really nice timber growing down on the right side of this bank coming out and those trees you know you can see the, the canopies are starting to come out and lean over in a way so there should be all sorts of different tension on those trees once they're cut typically when we harvest we like to leave most of the timber around our gullies to keep it shaded and uh, protected from wind and whatnot so we har rarely harvest on a steep bank like this unless there's some really good timber that's worth it or uh, stuff comes down and we're salvaging wood out of here so again, on the topic of uh, which trees to cut and which to leave and tension involved uh, altogether, uh, this is a uh, yellow birch tree here that grew up out of this bank and it's a native tree to Western New York. And uh, as you can see, it's got quite a lean to it, a huge knot, you know, there's probably not too much value up there in it. And uh, the, the hole in the bottom is a dead giveaway, it's a home tree. So knowing that there's just going to be tons of tension on that tree, we're a little poor, poorly formed, that would be a tree to leave in uh, wildlife value and aesthetics and, uh, you know, the root systems help hold in the bank here. So that's an easy one to uh, know that we're going to leave it. On harvesting uh, trees, you know, this tree here is a big American beech and from the bottom it looks great. Nice, tight, uniform bark. And it looks like it's a really big tree with a lot of good lumber in it. Now, when you look up, you can see that the tree is uh, in a rapid decline and the top is defoliated. Just a few lower limbs have leaves. So this tree's barely hanging on. Uh, last year it was alive. And another thing you gotta look into is what kind of pests and invasive species are in your area right now. So. Otherwise, we would leave this tree as a dead snag for wildlife, you know, because right now with the leaves off the canopy, other than the basal area that this tree takes up, it's let it allowing more light in than it was before. So you could cut this tree, drop it, and uh, let light in that way, or you could just leave it and let the wildlife take care of it through the years, and it might blow over in a windstorm or whatnot. But typically, if we have a lot of good surrounding timber, we're not going to drop this tree now and damage some future timber just to get it down and uh, for firewood because mostly beech rot out pretty quick and this wood can get really soft uh, in only a matter of five to seven years really. So, so this beech tree here we decided to leave now until we see signs of the beech scale disease which is started by a small piercing sucking insect which it's in the bark and will create a small hole for the fungus, the beech scale disease to grow, which starts to pop the bark out. And uh, right now we don't have any that are infested in this area right now with it. So this tree does not have any, we're gonna leave it. If we see signs of it, then we can get it down so it does not spread. Because right up the hill here, we have another beech the exact same size that's doing really well. So we'll take a walk up here. Check that out. Well, we got a big American beach in here. It's about 32 inches in diameter. And if you scan up on the canopy, you can see how well this tree's doing right now. And in the area right now with the rapid increase of the beech scale disease, this is a, a lot of people are talking about cutting as many beech as they can just to get rid of the scale disease. And the, the beech also does a lot of root suckering here, which are sprouts from the root system. Um, you know, it's not really taking up any 
timber area here because we're in the roots under the canopy of this beach. Uh, we're going to leave this for a wildlife tree and the fact that it's alive, it's so big and old that it's probably producing a good amount of nut as we can see on the ground here for the wildlife. And uh, it's just a beautiful tree. So aesthetic reasons and wildlife value, we're going to leave that one. And up here we've got another nice size tree that we're also leaving for the same reason. So this whole area here, we're not going to really rely on too much timber production in as much as we are wildlife value and aesthetics for the landowner. We've got some small pin cherry growing here, which are an understory species as well. And this big hemlock is also a pretty good tree. Uh, as far as wildlife value goes. We've got a few vines to take out to uh, keep the canopy healthy, but another beauty right here, eastern hemlock. You're also seeing an increase in the woolly adelgid uh, that's defoliating these trees, and it hasn't really hit in our area too hard yet, so we're really starting to just preserve our hemlocks in this area because they're very valuable to uh, building companies for all sorts of uses. It's one of my uh, favorite wood to cut. And it's also uh, one of the, my favorite wood for wildlife value because the deer rely on them in the winter time, uh, especially when the snow's on the ground and they have nothing to dig up and they've got to eat the uh, needles off the lower branches or fallen trees. So when you're harvesting timber, uh, the biggest thing too, you want to make sure is you've got good access. You can have nice timber and not have a way to get them out. And, uh, or you can really disrupt things by getting your timber out of the woods. So knowing how you're going to extract that timber from where it's growing, typically in our area, a lot of the nicest timber is towards the back of people's woodlots where it's harder to get out, longer skids, you have more ravines and uh, tough areas to get around. This woods is pretty beautiful right here. The previous uh, gentleman who worked in here before I got in here took really good care of the trails. So we have really good access. We've got a uh, nice ground in here. It rained last night and uh, we've got no mud because our trails are ditched and graded properly. So when the water does come, it runs off and we clean them every night and we clean them out. And we like to keep the logs up off the ground so we're not digging in real bad when we're skidding. And it's, a lot of it's picking your time to do it too. And you know, if there is a wet season and you can avoid it, when you're extracting your timber, that's the best thing you can do. But for some people making a living, it's hard to do that. And uh, you just have to harvest what you can on your woodlots. Lining it up is really tough. But along this trail, we'll take a walk down here and you can pan left and right and look at all the beautiful cherry. We've got a lot of intermediate black cherry growing in here and another ravine over to our right. So right now this cherry in here uh, has rebounded from the previous logging event about 15 to 20 years ago and right now they're reaching that 17 18 inch diameter so they're thriving in here uh, we're not going to really do too many uh, operations in here until these trees are ready to cut except for skid our timber from the back out this trail and on our way out we try not to skid up and bump into any trees if any trees are bumped they're designated bumper trees to save the root systems as well. So not much impact on the roots of these trees because we're not digging past our first layer of soil and breaking things up down there. Come on down, we've got some nice intermediate trees back in there. Right here we got a good cherry. Get a close-up on the bark of this one. Uh, this tree here, I, I typically, if I can hug a tree and my hands touch, it's not really harvestable, so it's probably about 16 to 17 inches in diameter, but that tight uniform bark right here is picture perfect, and we know that that tree is putting on good growth. If the bark was getting too flaky, or we had a lot of cherry gamosis in there, we would know that the tree needs some uh, attention or is stressed out. So right now, got a pretty good uh, grasp on this area. So we've got another beautiful, young, intermediate cherry tree here. The bark on it is pretty good, not as good as our last tree, 
but from this the angle here, looks like a great tree. And another tip to foresters is walk a 360 degrees around every tree. Because on the other side, it's hollow. Every woods that I go into, I like to do a little forensics on the uh, previous jaws because not every landowner, especially new landowners, know the history of the woods. So a lot of times I can tell a lot from just walking around and looking at all the signs. Um, right here in front of me is an old maple stump, sugar maple stump. And uh, we can tell because it's got a lot of this faulting fungus on there. It's really black and uh, it's starting to break up pretty good now. So our logging event that we know is 15 to 20 years. We don't know exactly. Um, judging by this, the degradation of this stump and how much it has rotted down, that's also a good sign that this woods is nearing its time to cut. So it's been a while by looking at the old stumps. You could say, oh, this woods, you know, you don't see any fresh sawdust. We don't have a nice surface here. So being sugar maple, we know it takes about 10, 12, 15 years to get to this rate. And then looking behind me, a lot of these young cherry here were probably very small at the time that this tree was cut. So now these trees have filled in the hole from this giant maple and uh, I think they're looking good. So when it comes to uh, marking timber and you do pick out your trees, one thing I do is I measure with a diameter tape to get a very accurate measurement at four and a half feet above the tree's root system, which is considered DBH, diameter at breast height. And that was where you can get a good ac accurate measurement to uh, run from your scales, that timber scales, and your international, your loyal, and your Scribner rules that account for our taper in different types of trees. So your Doyle and Scribner are typically for hardwood species, and the international quarter inch is for conifer trees with uh, more cylindrical taper to them. So this is a hemlock here, which we've measured up, and it's uh, at a 22 inch diameter. We're gonna harvest this one. And whenever we harvest a tree for a saw log, we'll use a horizontal paint mark across the tree. Um, that way we know, uh, you know if someone else is cutting the timber that we mark, they know that that's gonna be a saw log. Uh, another mark that you might see in the woods is a diagonal slash. Typically that would be on a cull tree or a firewood tree that would be processed into uh, mater burning material or pulp wood. So two different marks on the trees will delineate what the tree will be used for once it's cut down. And uh, typically we're only marking saw logs right now. We're not doing too much timber stand improvements on this job because everything else is in uh, good shape in the understory. So we're just harvesting one species on this job right now. And uh, that's another good reason for good access. So typically our timber markets are down right now. So we're not gonna think about doing any logging except for some local salvaging and harvesting for uh, some local building companies right now. So the uh, area we're working in right now, we're harvesting some mature hemlock out of a pretty solid uh, dominant hemlock stand here. We've got a few hardwoods, maple and cherry and uh, bitternut hickory that are mixed in here, but we're predominantly hemlock in this zone. So hemlock is a very, uh, it's a conifer species, so it has a lot of light blockage with the needles being on the tree year round. So, you know, typically the woods doesn't have too much undergrowth in here if it hasn't been harvested in a while. Uh, but now we're getting in here, we're going to stir up some of this organic soil to get some of the seed from the uh, pine cones mixed in with the dirt, the organic layers, and uh, get that germinating for some, hopefully some regrowth in here. But along with that, we're letting in some light. So, this is our entrance to the hemlock fan. And down here, we've only taken a few trees, so you can see the effects of the light from one tree that we cut over here. So the stump right next to the tractor is from the mature hemlock that we took. I marked that tree because A, it's right next to our access road and our skid trail, which makes it easy to get out. And we're also allowing some light onto our trail to keep our trail dry in the wet season. And we have quite a bit, uh, nice population of hemlock surrounding it. And we're almost kind of on a buffer and an edge to our hardwood stand here. So since we, you can see the sugar maple that uh, are coming into the hemlocks here, we're kind of letting in some light here to get some regrowth going down here. And you can see right now with the time of day that we're at, uh, later in early afternoon, 
Our sun is, uh, you know, at more of an angle right now, but you can see the amount of light on these trees here that uh, just one tree made. And it's not a huge difference um, because a lot of these other trees are really shady here, but it's definitely enough. We don't want to open it too much and give the other trees a thinning shock, especially this time of year when there's a lot of hot sun out there. So we just want to do it slowly and um, take them um, here and there. So a lot of what I was talking about is uh, pretty much just my experiences with timber. I learned a lot from a few loggers that I worked with over the years and tried to take in as much as I could from their knowledge and their experiences in the woods. But like I said, not everyone's going to agree with uh, other foresters on every topic. So some people might see some of my uh, ideas as new or different in the zones that you're working in. So. It really, um, being a good forester applies a lot to where you are in your geographic lo location and researching every aspect from your angles to your soil and everything involved with that. So a lot of it is, uh, there, there's a book you can read to learn about forestry, but a lot of it is just getting out there, doing it and learning from your experiences and noticing things as you're out there. You know, take the time to look at your trees, growth rings after you cut it down and uh, look, step back and look at the area it's in and stuff. So everyone's always in a hurry out in the woods to get things done, but sometimes you gotta just uh, take a step back and enjoy the day. Back to you, Trevor. Hey everybody, welcome back. Greg, that was amazing. Um, I hope everybody learned as much from that as I did. Um, definitely picked up a few tips in there, you know, what to look for, uh, you know, about that, uh, that beach. Uh, that beach uh, where it's rotten. And I've got some of that up here at my place and I've been wondering what was going on. So Greg, thanks a lot for that. Uh, everybody, that's Greg Rose from uh, uh, Rose Forestry in New York. So, you know, anybody in the area, if you're looking for some qualified uh, advice or you need somebody to give you some tips on how to manage your lot or manage it for you, I'm sure Greg could handle all that. So, uh, you know, definitely reach out to him, uh, anybody who's looking for some some uh, structure on how to how to make that better. That's Greg at Greg Rose Forestry. Okay, so what we're gonna we we'll finish up with that. Thanks everybody for sticking with us again. Give us a thumbs up. Let me know where you're watching from. If you got any questions that came up out of that, um, send them to me. Uh, put them in the stream. Uh, email them to me. It's Trevor at NorwoodSawmills.com. Um, if I can't answer them, I'll get them to Greg, and we'll get the answers right from him. So uh, that's something definitely that we want to do. So let's talk about, so next week uh, is going to be the wrap up for our summer series. Um, we're going to go through everybody's, uh, take the best excerpts out of everything that we've done so far this summer. I'm uh, going to sit down with Kelly and maybe uh, some others, and we're going to rewatch those clips and uh, kind of talk about some of the questions that came up from them and some stuff that might have been surprising to us that we've learned along the way. Uh, so if that interests you, make sure you stay tuned for next week. Okay. Let's get to the question and answer period. This is always kind of fun because I get to read what you guys have wrote in. I've already read them, but then I got to read them again and answer them for you here. So um, first off, let's get to some feedback from last week's video. Wicked response. I appreciate all you guys watching. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'm glad you like what we're doing. I kind of felt that there was a need for this and your response and uh, uh, audience uh, participation that I'm getting kind of shows that uh, that's definitely out there. So now last week, and I got a little bit of feedback from this from some of my peers in the business, uh, those that are out there that are watching, you know who, you know who I'm talking about. So I did a couple of things when we were working with that machine that you can't really endorse. Um, it's not something that Norwood endorses. It's just a habit that I have uh, around the sawmill. So you see me on the one side of that log adjusting adjusting and shifting it a little bit with that cant hook. As a rule, that's a no-no because -no, uh, that cable could come loose. Uh, the gear mechanism and that winch could come loose and then you're trapped behind that log. So just know that that's an accepted something that I'm aware of when I'm working around the machines. It's not something that I'm going to, you know, tell you guys to do. I mean, if you're doing it on your own accord, that's your own accord. But uh, I wanted to share that that's not something that uh, we recommend as a safe procedure. So we'll start with that. We'll get that one out of the way. Um, 
thanks guys for for holding me to task on that <laughs> i appreciate it so okay to the questions gw from virginia why is there no hour meter on the machines and you know that's a really good question um i don't know the exact answer to that should they have one i'd say yeah because uh, you're, you're bang on the money because how do you really know when it's time to service them um, I would imagine there's no hour meter on them because every time you add any type of little device, it boosts the cost on it. So um, it's just another add-on that, you know, guys can typically add on there after the fact. But uh, GW, I tell you for sure, put an hour meter on your machine. I think that's a smart move. Um, get you back in the seat so that you know exactly how much time's on it and when it's time to service it and go from there. Because otherwise, it's really a guess unless you're keeping a, a written log, uh, which I did. Uh, it's the only way I knew, and then I switched to an hour meter after that because it was just way easier to, to, to go about it from that. So, GW, thanks for that one. Uh, Kenneth, um, he has got owns an HD36, and he says, my machine, when it's all the way to the bottom and there's no weight on the cables, is uh, uneven. When I apply pressure to the cables, it goes back to where I've set it, and even, of course, is this normal? Ken, that is normal. Um, so what happens when you set it all the way down and that cover lands on the, on the lower carriage plate side rails there, the, it, it moves it at a square cause it's sitting unevenly on there. And as soon as you apply pressure to the cables, cause that's, what's holding it level. That's what you've adjusted to get that saw head to sit properly. Right? So as soon as there's pressure on the cables, that's when it's supposed to be level and, and realistically, you know, that last cut on that machine at the lowest point is going to be one inch and you can get down that far without the covers touching. So uh, I, you know, I don't cut, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit. I don't cut down to an inch on the machines unless there's a really good reason because nine times out of 10, if I'm going to hit something, it's always going to be on that last one inch board because I got something a little too high or it's just a hair more than it should be. And you end up, you know, I call it giving the dogs a haircut. Uh, you don't totally do them in, but you definitely see a shiny spot where you clip them. So um, I take that last board down to two inches, unless it's, you know, really valuable stuff. If you're cutting, that's got some dollar uh, amounts attached to it, then, you know, get it down to that last one inch board, but just be really, really careful uh, when you're doing that. But yes, definitely has to have pressure on the cables to keep that saw head uh, correct. So thanks for that one, Ken. Uh, Pierre wants to know about log tension. Um, which uh, I think, you know what, Pierre, I don't want to dig into that one too much other than because um, I think if you watched what Greg just did on that previous video that we aired, uh, he talks a little bit about where that tension comes from. What I can touch on um, is when you get into a log that you know has tension and you heard Greg talk about where the heart's off center in the tree, it's a sure indicator that that thing's got some tension in it, okay? Um, there's really nothing else you can do other than keep spinning that thing and cutting it and trying to pull the tension out of it evenly um, because it's going to curl no matter what. It's just how do you get it to do it the least, right? So, you know, if you're making that first cut and you see it's pulling off or it's coming up, you know, get it turned, make another cut, like like peeling an apple. You got to take it off a layer at a time and try and relieve the stress evenly. That might help a bit, but sometimes the, the tension's in there and the boards are going to curl and there's nothing you can do about it. So, uh Hopefully that helps you out with that one. Thanks, Pierre. Um, the other question he has is he watched one of the previous videos and it, he said he wants to know about simple green and it's not working for him. Okay, I know what we're talking about. So our other previous video that we did a couple episodes ago with Greg, he talked about how he uses simple green in his water. Um, and simple green is a good product and I've talked to lots of guys that use that. Um, I don't use it that much. I use a, a pretty steady mix of pine saw and uh, it's usually Dawn just because that's what's handy and they make that dark blue, uh, which I really like because I can see the water in the, in the tank and, and keep an eye on its level. But you don't always know uh, what the best is going to be for what you're cutting. Uh, you'd mentioned in here that you're cutting cedar. That's really stringy stuff. So big thing when you're cutting cedar is, is the proper feed rate. You, you might find that cutting, you're cutting slower than you should be. So play around with your feed rate when you're cutting that because you might be gaining more heat than is necessary by going too slow through the cut. So play around with the feed rate on it. You know, um, I've always found that cedar has to be cut pretty fast. 
Um, I got to lean into it pretty hard and it's got to make a really steady cut. Uh, it all piles up in the, in the, in the guards. There's no way around that. You got to stop every so often and pull the covers off and clean all that fuzz out of there. Cause it cuts those big, long curly strands. Right. Um, but I, you know, if the green, if the simple green's not working for you, I would switch to, you know, uh, one cup and do half, half, uh, dish soap and half pine salt, mix that all up in a five gallon pail and then dump that into your water tank. Because uh, if you don't, it'll all pool up on the spigot valve and then it won't work and you got to blow it out and it's a pain. So, yeah, mix it up in a five-gallon pail first and dump it in. Give that a try. That might help you out with that one. So, good question. Thanks a lot. Uh, Michael, uh, he noticed while cutting, I see sparks from the ceramics, uh, even with a new blade on. Uh, is this normal? And I noticed on last week's video, you didn't uh, talk about the rear ceramic when you were setting them true statement thank you very much again and i love it you guys when you catch me on this because it lets me know that you're watching so I, that rear one was already set up correctly and sometimes when i'm doing those videos i'm talking in my head as much as i'm talking out loud and i don't always realize that uh, i haven't uh, verbalized it so thanks michael for pointing that out um but the rear one what you want or what i do is i set it about a quarter inch out of the block okay and then i set it one eighth of an inch uh, gap behind the blade and, and the square okay so it's got to have that little room when it's when you're cutting it's got to be able to breathe just a little bit on there because when you get into the cut and the weight starts pushing on it it's going to move a little bit there's no way around it um, so that should help with the settings on there and get everybody on the same page with that one the 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 sparks on them that's normal uh, I get asked that all the time and uh, you know, I tell guys, if you're seeing sparks when you're cutting, like if you can run that blade out of the cut, run it, run it, run it, and it looks good, and there's no noise, and there's no sparks, good. And then when you get into the cut, uh, and you'll see it especially in the twilight hours when the light starts to get less, right, that really starts getting noticeable. Um, I just tell guys, that's the ceramics doing their job. So if you're seeing sparks on those things, it's getting into the cut, and something's pulling down on it, and it's causing it to spark on those ceramics. And that's how they get out of whack and why you've got to check them periodically uh, while you're cutting. So yeah, sparks are normal. You're going to see that. Um, little bit of advice there, uh, like I mentioned on the last one, is set them up on the weld. Because uh, typically uh, on some of the blades, the weld is a little bit heavier than the blade itself. So if you set it up just on the blade, you could be, depending on how tight you're running them, you could be clipping the ceramics on the way through. Uh, and that'll, of course, cause a little bit of sparks as well. So. Uh, hopefully that helps you, Michael. Thanks for that question. Uh, Russell wants to know, what do you do with the boards uh, when you get down to the point with the pith or the, uh, the center of the log? Um, typically with the pith or the heart of the log, what you want to do is you cut all the way around it until you get either a 4x4 four four or a 5x5. Five five. That's what you're going to leave out of that heart material because anything smaller is just going to come apart. And even four by four, sometimes it wants to start coming apart on that on that hard area or the pith. So uh, what happens a lot with those is guys cut them into four by fours, five by fives, and they go into a lot of pallet industry uh, uh, to put those together. A lot of guys use them just for stacking. Um, it's just good. It's just good kind of material that you can have around for putting stuff on. It's not really good for any type of structure unless you're going to marry it into a pallet or something. A pallet, uh, put a other bunch of one-inch boards attached to it. But um, typically four by four, five by five. Take that out of the heart and just keep that around. Use it for stacking and, and whatever else you might need. Unless you've got a pallet manufacturer near you, um, maybe contact one of those guys. See if they'd be interested in uh, taking it from you. I bet you they probably would. So that's a good question, Russell. Thanks for that. Bear Spirit Walking um, has a question about, he says, so put the leading edge of the blade out over the front of the band wheel. So I'm not totally sure what that means, uh, Bear Spirit, but I'll just revisit that, how I set that up for you, which we did on that last video. Um, what you want to do is, so there's a swoop in the tooth, right? It goes down, it goes up to the tip, it goes down, it goes up to the tip, it goes down, it goes up to the tip. And the bottom of that swoop, or that swoop we're calling, is, a, is the gullet, okay? So the bottom of the U on the gullet is what needs to be, when you run your finger down the front of the band wheel, the front of the band wheel and the gullet should be even, 
okay? Now, if they're hair either way, don't get too concerned about it, but more or less, it should be even with the front of that mandrel. So the only thing sticking out the front is just the, the teeth, okay? And what that does is it gives you more control of the band, which stops that blade from wanting to, to pitch and tip while you're cutting, because you got, you know, you're holding it back on the band heels rather than letting it come out in the front, which blade lead, too much blade lead is what causes, uh, you know, a lot of unevenness, especially in tension. So good question. Thanks a lot. And that'll wrap that up, guys. So again, thanks very much for watching. I appreciate all the questions. Keep them coming. Give me a thumbs up. Let me know where you're calling from. And I hope you enjoy your day. Thank <laughs> you.